go. It is day one of our new material, and we are starting with a unit on kinetics, and eventually we'll get into something known as nuclear chemistry. But kinetics is just the study of the rate of reactions, and just real quickly, we can see that reactions can take place either really quickly, like combustion reactions are typically really quick, what we see here, or you can have something like rusting, which is typically a pretty slow process. So kinetics refers to the rate of a reaction. So if we go back and think about what rate means, it's some sort of change over time. So you're looking at some sort of speed. So if you were to, and I think it's always a good idea for you guys to be able to relate something graphically, if you were to think about something that has a constant rate or a constant speed, then that means, and actually we should label these, I guess, all of these would be distance over time. So that would mean you would have a line like that that would just be a straight line. It doesn't have to be right down the middle. That's a constant time That's or speed. That's a constant speed. All of those would be constant speeds. If you had something that has acceleration to it, think about what that means. That means you've got a greater distance over a unit of time. So what would, your cur what would it look like there? Okay, so you'd see it curving like that, where your distance increases over that same fraction of time. And deceleration, that would be the opposite, where you're slowing less distance per unit of time. And then finally, this last one, what this says is acceleration, then constant speed, then deceleration, then no motion. So what we would expect there... If you have acceleration, again, you get this curve like that. Eventually, you have constant speed, so it flattens out. That's not very pretty, but that's a straight line there. Deceleration, so it starts to curve in this direction. And then eventually, no motion. That means over time, the time continues, but you get no gain in, speed, in distance. So that's what we would expect for graphic of that. Again, we don't know what to expect on your end of course exam, the star test. So you could al you sh always should be able to think about things graphically and what something would look like there. Okay, we said reaction rates vary, and there's a couple different ways that you can measure, actually more than a couple, uh, ways that you can measure reaction rates. You can think about how your reactant starts to disappear, or you can think about how your product starts to up here. So when we do this, let's see what we've got written here. It says rate of disappearance of one. So for disappearance, we're talking for, about disappearance of one of the reactants. And then the opposite would be appearance of one of the products. So if you were to try and describe that maybe in a formula, you would think that for your disappearance of a reactant, you would think about the concentration of your reactant, the change in concentration of your reactant over time is what we're looking at. And here, for um, appearance of one of your products, you would think about it as the change in your product's concentration over time. And to be honest, we really should throw in a negative there for the first one. I missed that. But you're going to have um, your reactants are going to decrease. Okay, so again, that's just showing you what a formula would look like there. Okay, some other things that you could use visually just to figure out how this reaction's proceeding. Um, this example it says, well, you can have disappearance or appearance of a color. So we've seen that. We know that some solutions have colors to them. So if you started off with something like copper to nitrate, this is a beautiful, well, I was going to say bright. Here, let me actually put the proper colors. This is a beautiful blue color. And when um, you create zinc nitrate, there's really no color to zinc nitrate. So you would know that this reaction, copper 2 nitrate, is bright blue. How would you know when this reaction is complete? The blue would, disappears is what happens. So just showing you that color can be an indicator for a reaction rate. 
Okay, another thing, if you have something like gases that are being produced, then you can uh, measure the change in the volume if you keep your pressure constant, or you can ch measure the change in pressure if you keep your volume constant. So um, quite often you'll keep the pressure constant and the volume changes, so you can just measure the milliliters or liters of gas that's produced. So in this example, what would you be measuring? Which, which substance? H2, the hydrogen. So you would just be measuring the volume of this is how you would be able to practically do that if you were back in lab. Okay, other properties that you can use to measure the rate of a chemical reaction. You can have a change in mass. And we've done things like that. You started off with a piece of solid and the reaction progressed and then you took that solid out and you rinsed it off, dried it, and you remassed it. So we've done things like that. Change in temperature. Sometimes you have endo or exothermic reactions. And then also the production of an odor. A lot of those things aren't quite as objective to be able to measure as, as easy to do back then. <laughs> Okay, um, in this example it says, which reactant or product would you choose to measure in order to determine the rate of the reaction? What property would you measure? Um, so in the first one with the zinc plus hydrochloric acid, what might you measure? More than one right answer. Okay, so you could measure the volume of your hydrogen gas that's produced. What else might you measure? Zinc, so you mass your zinc before the reaction, then you mass it after the reaction. So those would be some pretty good um, ideas. Next one, same deal. We are looking at copper plus silver and nitrate. What might be some ideas here? Copper, again, you can measure your mass of the copper before and after. You could even measure the mass of your silver before and after. What's one other idea? Right, your color, because your copper two nitrate turns blue. So once that blue has um, stopped turning a darker blue, then you know you're, you're done. Okay, then we get into something known as collision theory. And what this says is that the rate of a reaction depends upon the collisions between those reacting particles. Um, in fact, not only does it depend upon the collisions, the energy of the collisions, but it depends upon the proper orientation of those collisions. So particles, they have to have enough energy, they have to have enough speed when they collide for this reaction to take place. But not only that, they also have to have the proper orientation for those reactions to take place and to form those products. Um, and it, this is just a silly little graphic, but just showing if you don't have enough energy, then there's no reaction that takes place. But if these particles collide with enough energy, then it changed, I guess, one of these uh, atoms translated over or went over and changed to these guys. So any kind of change, this is what we're going to look at in the next few things here, any kind of change that affects these collisions, either the orientation or the energy involved in these collisions, also affects the rate of the reaction. And our first one that we're getting to is surface area. So if we were to think about, um, here it says larger surface area increases the frequency at which particles collide. Which one of these has a larger surface area? If I have that, or I have the same mass of it, but I've got them all in tiny pieces. So these guys all have a greater surface area. If you were to powder something instead of one big lump, then it has a much greater surface area. All of these individual surfaces are available to react with the other reactant that's involved in that uh, chemical reaction. So you would expect this to have a greater reaction rate. Example, um, I guess we could say something like powdered, powdered sugar. I will look in the back and maybe we can do a little demo if we have time after this. But powdered sugar versus cubed sugar. So I can actually put that in a Bunsen burner flame. My powdered sugar is going to burn and combust a little bit. This is the same idea for grain elevators. Let's do that example grain elevators where 
because of um, all of those fine particles, if you get some time, little spark in there, they can very easily ignite and explode. So um, large surface area means greater reaction rate. Okay, next one is concentration. An increase in the concentration means that there's more particles to collide. So it's like us running down the hall. If you, if you try and run down the hall right now, chances are you can make it pretty well. As soon as it's passing period and you've got 20,000 people in the hallway and you try to run down there, you're going to be colliding with everybody. So if you've got more particles, there's more collisions. Um, if we had our example of, let's have hydrochloric acid. Yeah, we've got a couple particles in there. That's it. Or you have a whole bunch. How quickly can I draw these? Not very quickly. So if you have a whole bunch of them, they are going to have a greater reaction rate. So um, um, greater reaction rate. Because there's more particles, so greater collisions, greater number of collisions. Okay, temperature. Here we see that an increase in temperature causes the kinetic energy of the particles to increase and to collide more often with more energetic collisions. So if you increase that temperature, those particles have more energy to them, greater kinetic energy. So since they're running around, it's like, it's like uh, hanging out with a bunch of kindergartners that during nap time or right after they've eaten five candy bars. So when they have those five candy bars, they've got a lot of energy and they're running around into each other. But when it's nap time, it's, it's a lot um, less collisions there. And one thing to remember here, this is an important one you might want to put a star by, is that for each 10 degrees increase in temperature, this is just a rule of thumb. So it, it holds pretty true for most substances. For each 10 degrees Celsius increase in temperature, the reaction rate doubles. So let's do an example. Let's say um, you increase the temperature of something from 20 to 50 degrees Celsius. What that means is going to tw from 20 to 30 degrees Celsius, it's doubled. And going from uh, 30 to 40, it's doubled. Going from 40 to 50, it is doubled. So how many times faster is that? So... So, wait, wait, two to the third, two, four, eight times faster, sorry, right, eight times faster, eight times faster, so that's what we would expect to see on something like that, again, that's just a rule of thumb, but I think it's kind of a good idea for you guys to, to understand that, um, and I guess we could just make a little note, this is easy enough. If you increase the temperature, you increase your collisions. So therefore, your reaction rate is greater. Okay, next one we want to look at is just the nature of the reactants and products. And we've looked at this before. We could even look at our periodic table and say, hey, there's a big difference between something like lithium and francium. Both of them are alkali metals. Francium is much more reactive than lithium because of the electrons where, you know, further away from the nucleus, etc. But it also goes deeper than that. We could look at the bonds that must be created or broken in these, um, in these, these molecules. So, for example, if you had something like, let's just do a real simple organic compound. If you have methane, compared to, I don't know, let's do pentane, if you've got these, these two, in this case, there, this is going to take longer, so this is slower, and this one would be faster because of the number of bonds that you have, or if you have more complex bonds. Um, triple bonds, things like that, you would expect that to be slower. So again, it says a chemical change where fewer bonds are broken and made will take less time, will be faster than those more complex molecules. And then we have pressure. This should feel like Le Chatelier's again coming back to you. Here we see pressure only affects reaction rates where gases are involved. 
that's an important thing. An increase in pressure will increase the reaction rate if the gas is a reactant, but increase in pressure will decrease the reaction rate if the gas is a product. I would not try and memorize that. I would just look at it and think about Le Chatelier's. So for example, let me see if there's anything I want to write down about this first of all. Um, well, no, I think we'll just stick with these examples that I've got here. So if we look at this first example here, we've got gases on the left, no gases on the right. In fact, you even have three moles of gas on the left. So if you were, let's see, it says, how are the reaction rates of the following reactions affected by an increase in pressure? So again, think about Le Chatelier's. If you increase the pressure, essentially you're just pushing those molecules together closer, so you're increasing that concentration of the gases only. So by increasing the pressure, I'll do this for this one. Remember, we looked at this as being our big water tank right here. So increasing the pressure is the same as increasing the concentration on this side. So we make that big mound of water. So which way is, which way is this direction, uh, reaction going to proceed? To the right. So the forward reaction. So you would produce more of your H2O in this case is what it's saying. I really don't like that, rea that example too much, but that'll work for us. Um, next one. An increase in pressure. How would that affect the, our second one? No effect, because there are no gases, so it wouldn't change it at all. And finally, our third one, an increase in, uh, an increase in pressure would cause it to shift left, because here is your gas, your only gas, so it's going to cause it to go the other way. Okay, so that's what we see for pressure. Again, it only affects gases. Make sure you circle that. And then last couple things that we've got. A catalyst, we're going to spend time talking about this more tomorrow, but just to give you an idea, what a catalyst does is it makes the energy needed for successful collisions lower so that it is easier for the reaction to occur. This increases the reaction rate. So um, we're going to see that, well, let's just first say, I'm just summarizing, it speeds up reaction. And we're going to see tomorrow when we talk about this that it's not used up in the reaction. So typically we think about substances being used. If you start with these reactants, they're going to get used up and become uh, turn into products somehow. But this does not get used up. Um, it's probably worth note noting there is a natural catalyst. in your body, what are the natural natural catalysts in your body called? Carbon. Enzymes. I heard it. Enzymes. There we go. Enzymes are natural catalysts. We all have them. And then the other side of this, if it's not a catalyst, the opposite would be an inhibitor. And um, this just causes us to need more energy to make these collisions successful. So what this does is it decreases the reaction rate. It's the opposite of the catalyst. Um, any examples? Can you guys think of any inhibitors? We use them all the time. They're pretty... We, antifreeze. Antifreeze, that's actually a colligative prop. We use that for colligative properties to change the boiling or freezing point. Um, you're kind of on the right the right pathway because what you just said is if you make something colder it's going to slow down the rate of the reaction so we're thinking about substances that actually slow down a rate of reaction you don't want your food to go bad so what what do we use salt salt which is a preservative there are many salts so a preser a preservative would be an example of an inhibitor um, it probably is. Okay, sunscreen. There's a lot of uh, sunscreens that have chemical blocks to them, so those are really inhibitors. Um, maybe we'll end this on a really light note here. Embalming fluid is also an inhibitor. It slows down that reaction rate, rate of decay. So that's really all we have today. We will finish this up tomorrow with reaction rates and reaction pathways and look at some... Um,
mechanisms for this, how this all takes place.